Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to the November Nanos, the shorter episodes I do for stuff that I want to talk about but can't be stretched out to a full episode. This time around I am super excited to tell you about one of my favourite series of books, the Polity Novels by Neil Asher. Asher is a constant contender for the number two spot on my favourite authors list. Um, actually, to be honest, there's about five or six who share that privilege, and I doubt I'll ever be able to truly choose between them. Here's the basic synopsis. The entire collective book's timeline has so far taken place over 600 years or so, starting around 2400. About 350 years before that, uh, so about 30 years from now or 50 years from when the books were written, humanity invented artificial intelligence, and said artificial intelligence rose up and took over. Now, that sounds like pretty generic sci-fi so far, right? Well, in this case, it turns out the AI are pretty decent people when you get right down to it. It turns out they're actually much better at running humanity than humanity ever was. They didn't even take over with violence. It ended up being called the Quiet War because no one fired a shot. Humanity just woke up one morning and found out the AIs were running everything. Humans aren't treated badly at all. In fact, because hyper-intelligent super beings are now running the show instead of blustering, slimy, corrupt politicians, humanity's technological level leaps forward by millennia. Aging can be stopped, anything but the most fatal wounds can be repaired and interstellar travel is cracked, we're all much better off. This new human-robot society calls itself the Polity, and while the AI are unquestionably in charge, they treat everyone equally, be they organic or electronic. As you can imagine though, there are still some humans who value governing themselves over all the perks of the Polity. They're allowed to bugger off to some distant planet if they want, so there's a bunch of non-Polity human worlds around. Uh, however, if at any point more than 50% of the population of said worlds decide that they want to join, or it becomes clear that the governing bodies are abusing people, the polity will come and take over, by force if necessary. There's also no shortage of FREEDOM shouting people who want to destroy the AI or liberate their particular planet from them. They're usually referred to as separatists, and they often crop up in stories as antagonists, though not usually the main ones, as they rarely pose a real threat to the polity when you come right down to it. The artificial intelligences themselves are just so cool in this, because half of them have really good senses of humour. Um, at one point someone asks them why they don't just keep increasing their own intelligence and ability to basically godhood level and ascend to a higher level of existence and leave humanity behind, and their answer was basically, well, where would the fun in that be? Some of them have really weird sounding names. Uh, the big head honcho who's in charge of everything calls himself Earth Central because it really wanted a neutral sounding name that no one country, creed or religion could associate itself with above everyone else. However, the de facto second in command, a massive moon sized spaceship that deals with a lot of the shit that happens on the edge of human space, calls itself Jerusalem and no one can figure out why. At one point it hints that it may have chosen the name just to mess with people's heads for hundreds of years. That's not to say that being a part of the polity is all hunky-dory, as the AIs do tend to be a bit ruthless at times. Um, each AI, no matter how big and important it is, is 100% willing to lay down its life for the good of the many at a moment's notice, and they kind of tend to expect the same from everyone else as well. For example, trying to use hostages to get anywhere with the AI is less than pointless if they consider stopping you unavoidably necessary. Again, I try not to judge them too harshly for this while reading it, because you get so many examples of the AI being selfless with their own existence, it really is more that they hold themselves and everyone else to a higher standard. Spaceships and warships are basically people in this. They have their own minds, uh, they sometimes have crews, but they don't need them as they're perfectly capable of running themselves. There's a few reasonably sized ones that call themselves attack ships, but then there's the dreadnoughts and you just do not fuck with them. They range in size from several miles long to so big they can't go into orbit around populated planets because their gravitational pull would fuck things up. Ooh, and then there's the war drones and I fucking love these guys. Hundreds of thousands of them were made in a hurry when the polity started losing a long and bloody interstellar war with a race called the Praedor. Um, I'll come back to them later. They're usually designed to look like some sort of insect or animal. If said animal was the size of a tank, and bristling with futuristic weapons. War drones tend to do the advanced weaponry equivalent of fighting dirty. Um, you know how in some science fiction shows they're always coming up with weird and convoluted ways of beating the odds and overcoming superior numbers? Well, that's how the war drones fight all the time. They're constantly doing cool things like firing missiles off in the wrong direction so they can slingshot around a moon and hit the enemy in the rear, or making someone think they're firing useless bullets on their thick armour when they're actually infiltrating their ship with microscopic robots to fuck them up. The problem with the 
them is, if you make an AI too fast, irreparable personality or mental problems can be included in their crystal brains. The polity needed a lot of them very, very quickly, and the end result was, after the war ended, there were hundreds of slightly mad, incredibly bored war veterans armed with WMDs as sidearms, a short attention span, and not much to do. Quite a few of them ended up shutting themselves down out of sheer boredom, and the rest found themselves on a perpetual quest to find something nasty enough to be worth their time, volunteering to police the most dangerous planets in the polity, or going on constant suicide missions, and being quite annoyed if they survived. Despite this, or possibly because of it, it is always great when these guys get involved in the stories. You never know quite what's going to happen, but it will involve explosions. Asher shows that he has an advanced grasp of astro, quantum, and theoretical physics, but he's also very good at dumbing it down for likes of me without making it seem like he's dumbing it down. It stops these books from crossing the line between science fiction and science fantasy, despite the miraculous things that people can do now. Technology has advanced super far, but it doesn't feel like magic. There's still rules to it, and Asher sticks to them, or makes a big deal out of them being broken. I believe there's currently 15 full novels set in this universe and a bunch of short stories, but I might be getting a little mixed up because he's written a lot of other stuff that I like as well, so don't quote me on those figures. They usually come in three to four book series, though the first one went to five. They center around a main protagonist, usually a human male, uh, and then it will have several supporting cast members of all genders, races, and designs from both the good and bad side that will get their own chapters, though not as many. Ian Cormack is the hero of the first and arguably main series. The oversimplified way of describing him is he's the James Bond of this universe. He works for Earth Central Security, which is kind of like the Special Forces CIA. I mean, there's not a direct equivalent from current modern times. One of the coolest things about this guy is his weapons. He employs a thin gun as his sidearm, which, as the name implies, is a very narrow gun that you can hide easily that fires bursts of aluminium dust. Then there's Shuriken, which has got to be one of the coolest science fiction weapons ever thought up. Basically, it's a throwing star that's equipped with basic AI and an anti-gravity generator, so it's capable of independent action once Cormac throws it. It's made of something called hardened chain glass, which just looks like glass but is harder than titanium, and when it fully unfolds it can be almost two meters in length. What's really cool is that no one can figure out just how smart it is. At first it was just supposed to obey simple instructions, but every now and again it does something that suggests it's developed somewhat of an attachment to its owner, like taking the initiative to block bullets being fired at him. What's quite amusing is, after coming up with the concept of the polity, Asher clearly got a little bored of it because he wrote a whole bunch of books set in the same universe, but on planets that aren't a part of it. My favourite of which being the mostly ocean planet called Spatajay. There is a whole long history to this planet, but currently it's on good terms with the polity, but chooses not to join it because the residents like maintaining a low level of technology, namely wooden sailing ships. Spatajay itself is fucking scary because there's all kinds of sea monsters that will eat you in a second. So you're probably wondering how the fuck does anyone survive there for any significant amount of time? This is where it gets interesting because there's a virus on the planet. Um, it turns out to not be a naturally occurring one, but you gotta read the books for that. Um, once it infects you, it forms tendrils between almost every cell in your body, hardening you up, granting you super strength, eternal life, and Wolverine-like healing powers. It can also adapt your body very fast to new environments. Like, if you're drowning, it will give you gills, or if you're inhaling like poison gas, it will just convert your lungs to be able to breathe that. That, however, leads to one of its biggest drawbacks, because if you don't get enough to eat, it starts adapting you into something that doesn't require food, and that is not a human. But as long as you stay well fed, it's a really cool thing to have. So yeah, it's basically a planet of sea monsters populated by super-powered Amish pirates. I'll say that again. A planet of sea monsters populated by super-powered Amish pirates. If that concept isn't enough to get you to try these books, I, I just can't relate to you anymore. Getting back to the polity as a whole, there are aliens in these books, but it's not like Star Trek where there's new ones popping up all the time. Most of them have been extinct for millennia. Asher takes into account what people who misuse the Drake equation do not, the phenomenal lifespan of the universe and the chances of multiple intelligent species existing within travelling distance of one another within the same time period. One of the few living alien species that the humans do encounter are the Praedor, and once again, I fucking love these guys because they are the most unapologetically, irredeemably vile creatures I've ever read about. FYI, if you look at how it's spelt, Praedor is probably just my headcanon way of pronouncing it, but I've got too used to doing it to stop now, I'm sorry. They kind of look like giant armoured crabs, but have more complex manipulators at the front behind their big claws. Um, their entire society is based around having lots of children, then enslaving them using pheromones to be your army, and they casually partake in murder and cannibalism as a daily routine, 
Plus, they have absolutely no concept of empathy or mercy. The world building in this is just phenomenal. I know this sounds a little weird because of all the crazy shit I've described so far, but after a few books, the policy just starts to feel so fucking real, you know? By the way, I'm not going to talk about the giant alien space probe that calls itself Dragon and speaks only in riddles, because I really want you to experience him for yourselves. If you were to demand some cons from me about these books, I would say that there are a lot of copy-pasted characters. All the protagonists from the other Polity book series are basically Cormac again. I mean, they have different motivations and different quirks, but at their core, they're all exactly the same character. So too, the slightly mental war drones who appear in the different stories, um, Amstrad, Sniper, and Aretch, are all pretty much interchangeable. This isn't too much of a hindrance, as these stories aren't a personal journey. I mean, the main character is important, but he's not the focus. Another downside I've noticed is sometimes the ending to a middle book in a set can be a little underwhelming, usually because it's building up to a grand finale in the next one. Again, not a major hindrance, it's just something I've noticed. Anyways, thank you so much for patiently listening to me gush, probably incoherently about this series, my beautiful watchers, and do let me know in the comments or on social media if you decide to give them a read. I love discussing them with people. Peace. Hey beautiful watchers, I just wanted to give you a quick reminder that there's a variety of rewards you can earn by becoming a Patreon, including early access to all videos, getting to be a part of the survey about how many people saw the film and read the book, or playing Minecraft with me on my 24 hour server. Higher level contributors can also join the Dom Skype chat room, and best of all, choose future episodes of Lost in Adaptation. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the Dom, I can't do that, all of my funds are being put towards raising an army to defeat my house's ancient rival and avenge my father! Fear not, if you would instead be willing to like, share, subscribe, or a combination of all three, that goes a long way towards helping my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. Have a most pleasant day, and I will see you soon.